Uh, Dr. Over recording. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dahid Talagani for joining us today. Actually, this is fun. Um, uh, you were before my time, but I'm realizing this is a really nice uh, reunion of sorts. So it's thank you so much for returning to visit us and share your knowledge with our students. Just a little bit of information. Um, Professor Ar Arash Dahid Talagani is a tenure associate professor in the petroleum engineering at uh, Pennsylvania State University. He, before joining Penn State, he was an associate professor of petroleum engineering in Louisiana State University. He earned his PhD in, in petroleum engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. He has spent about 12 years combined experience in applied engineering research in academia. As a registered professional engineer, <laughs> Dr. Dahi Talagani has numerous publications and six patents in the field of drilling and completions. In 2014, he received the Distinguished Achievement Award for Petroleum Engineering Faculty from the Society of Petroleum Engineering. We were just talking about that organization. He has also received the SBE uh, Eastern North America Regional Completion Optimization Technology Award in 2017. He's currently conducting research in reservoir geomechanics, hydraulic fracturing, wellbore in integrity, and geothermal engineering. He is selected as SB Distinguished Lecturer in the coming year. We look forward to that. All right, um, Dr. Dahi Talagani, I'll, I won't steal your thunder. I'll leave you to introduce your topic and the floor is now oh. yours. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for the extensive introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's very exciting to be back, although virtually, uh, among some familiar faces. And um, I wish uh, very soon we can meet in person and uh, can you know, resume these activities in person. The topic that I'm going to uh, present today is something that I have worked in the last four or five years trying to develop the new type of Lost circulation materials that can meet the new adventures in the subsurface energy for the geothermal, for drilling through natural fracture reservoir, and uh, so forth. But before starting my um, presentation, I would like to acknowledge the graduate students, postdocs, and also collaborators at LSU and Oklahoma University. Uh, for contributing to this research. My colleague, Goshan Lee at LSU, he is the polymer chemist that who help us with developing some of the uh, polymer that we need uh, for conducting this research. Oklahoma University, Dr. Saleh, they, had a, they have a very good uh, equipment setup, experimental setup for running some high uh, temperature loops to uh, test some of the Lost circulation materials that we have uh, developed uh, in this research. Uh, the sponsors are partly by DOE, ERE, ADNOC, CMPC, and other entities. So here is the outline of my research. Basically, first I have a short introduction into the topic, and then we will talk about uh, how treating the lost circulation materials in general. What are the um, basically available methods in the industry, uh, available materials. Then we talk about shape memory polymers is a, a specific product or material that we have used for uh, developing this new type of LCM in this research. And then it will be followed with some basic uh, experimental uh, research, experimental um, testing efforts, as well as a simulation, and then at the end, I will uh, briefly present you more sophisticated geometries that we have developed uh, more recently uh, for dealing with problems. You know, um, in general, um, I think um, everybody, uh, our petroleum engineering students in the seminar, they know very well that drilling fluid are essentials to provide the pressure overbalance for cooling the bit, for cutting transport. Any event that uh, led to the losing of this drilling fluid is called lost circulation. Lost circulation, if it happens, is costly because um, first of all, your company, the um, drilling company or operator have paid for the mod. And it also come up with some environmental costs. It can cause uh, environmental damage. It can also um, come with some uh, safety hazard, reducing the overall rate of penetration. A very good example of that 
is the challenges right now, geothermal drillers have with this problem. You know, geothermal resources are mostly located in crystalline rocks. So crystalline rocks, because they are so brittle, they are prone to natural, uh, and you know, they have abundant natural fractures and having abundant natural fracture could cause, you know, uh, pose lots of challenges uh, for the engineers to make sure that they keep or maintain drilling fluid inside the uh, well. So to give you some rough idea, however, I apologize that some of these numbers uh, could be uh, changed a little bit. You know, these numbers are um, roughly before COVID. So uh, the numbers are up and down everywhere nowadays because of the fluctuation in the market. But you know, um, about 26% of the wells that are drilled nowadays in the world, they have a uh, loss circulation problem. This problem is more uh, distinctive in geothermal drilling and also when you are drilling through the naturally fractured reservoir like carbonates. There are um, some formations, for example, in Kuwait, Colombia, even in Louisiana, that when they are drilling through them, they are drilling with the complete loss. So basically, you don't have any mud circulation back. They have to just keep uh, pumping mud to drill through that zone section to avoid problem. Loss circulation can happen because of the several different things. It could be because of the caverns, uh, it could be because of the coarse natural fractures or induced fractures, drilling induced fractures. Loss circulation can be a big problem in the high permeability formation. What I'm going to discuss today is not loss circulation problem in the high permeability formation. Whenever the matrix, your matrix has a high permeability, it's easy to seal off the uh, formation um, and with the commercially available loss circulation material. The main challenge right now for the industry is how to uh, seal the fractures effectively. You know, uh, sealing the fractures um, could be problematic. Number one, you don't want to seal these fractures permanently if these fractures are located in the pay zone because you have damaged the formation uh, permeability. The other situation that you might deal with that um, is the fact that uh, uh, for the big fractures, white fractures, the available com uh, commercial products in the market may not be uh, good enough for this purpose. In general, there are three different ways to handle loss circulation problem. If you anticipate loss circulation events while drilling, number one is using casing while drilling. Casing while drilling is very expensive approach. It reduces your ROP significantly. And you need to know that ahead of time. So if something happens in flight, you cannot really uh, rely on casing while drilling approach because it requires special equipment at the field. The second approach is MPD managed pressure drilling. Managed pressure drilling is very good. Um, in some places is very effective, but it's, it's a new method. It has its own um, limitation. For instance, MPD is very limited for the high temperature formations, uh, the seals and the materials, parts that is used for the MPD are not very well adjusted for the uh, high uh, fluid, temp uh, high formation fluids. And the last resort is using loss circulation materials. Loss circulation materials may exist in different form. They might be in the form of the granular shape. Uh, they could be in the form of the fiber, um, you know, some materials that have been used historically for this purpose, I can mention walnut shell, uh, peanut shell. Uh, sometimes they have used rubbers uh, for this purpose. You know, for example, the um, uh, pieces of the tires and things like that. The most um, common widely spiritually used um, LCM in the market are the granular LCMs. However, recently there are um, some uh, new products that have been come to the market, uh, Halliburton and Baker Hughes, and also Shulombaja have their own uh, fibrous or mixture of the fibrous and granular material for sealing these fractures. It's notable that some of these materials 
have a specific limitation in terms of, for example, um, the environment or the temperature that they can work. Uh, for example, calcium carbonate historically have been very used successfully around the world for um, stopping the loss through the um, fracture and the matrix. But, but calcium carbonate is not going to work in temperature above 150 degrees C. Uh, so cons considering these um, issues, it's very um, important to come up with some uh, solutions that can be used uh, in the field to seal, at the, uh, to seal the white fracture. At the same time, it should be something that you can circulate it. The problem is that when you are uh, injecting or pumping LCM materials with your drilling fluid, you should consider the fact that that's true that for sealing the wider fracture, larger fractures, you need to have a larger piece of LCMs. But at the same time, if you are using a very coarse or very big LCM particles, it will go and clog your uh, BHA. It can damage your um, bottom hole assembly, drill bit. And if you bypass a drill bit, knowing the fact that nowadays, most of the time, they are using MWD or LWD while drilling, the size of your annulus space is very limited. So the point is that you are very limited in the size of the material or particles that you can pump down hold. At the same time, you need to have large particles to seal large fractures. So knowing this challenge, we try to come up with a solution. We talked about something that is small, when we are pumping it, pump it down hole, and when it reaches to the fracture, it expands or pops up and seal the fractures. So following this fiction or magics, we, uh, you need to come up with something that stimulate or led to popping up of this particle. And what can be better than the down hole temperature? Having a higher, temperature in the subsurface, you can take advantage of the heat um, as a stimulant and use that for uh, activating this small particle and make them large enough or big enough. So knowing this problem, the main motivation for this research was designing new type of LCM systems that can be um, used in the field. It can be used at the larger scale and it doesn't have the uh, limitations that you see most of the time with the uh, commercial products available in the market. It needs to meet uh, both downhole equipment and also fracture width requirements. So to address this problem, uh, we take advantage or benefit from shape memory effect. Shape memory effect is an effect that you see in some polymers. So basically you can program some polymers, you can, we call this a step programming. Basically you can temporarily, temporarily change the shape of your particles. You can temporarily uh, pull them, fold them or bend them. And when they expose to a stimulant, the stimulant can be high temperature, a stimulant could be microwave, it could be electricity current. When your material is exposed to this stimulant, it can go back to its original form, okay? So we, um, I, I should note that we are working with the shape memory polymers. Shape memory alloys have been found earlier. They are very popular, but they are super expensive. And with the shape memory alloys, you can basically recover a large value of stress. But here with the shape memory polymers, we wanna recover high value of strain. Basically you wanna increase the size of these particles. You don't wanna induce huge stress in the subsurface to crack the rock. So having said that, during the programming stage, which is three steps, we first 
what we are going to do is first heat up the polymer above its glass transition zone, and then we deform the polymer and then reduce the temperature or cooling of the polymer below the glass transition zone. At this stage, your polymer is a program. So whenever this polymer, as you see the program stage, the green one, whenever it's exposed to a temperature above the glass transition zone, this polymer will quickly recover its original shape. How fast it would be? It would be very quick. You know, the whole um, shape recovery process is a statistical process. Um, it depends on the polymer that you use for this purpose. The degree of the recovery, it could be different. The other things that I like to mention is that the amount of the recovery, it can be, for example, we can compress or pull the polymer particles or fibers, sometimes 50%, 100%, or compress them 50% to the original volume. And then when they are exposed to the high enough temperature, we can, they can recover the original shape. Uh, this is the basic of the whole concept behind that. However, uh, nowadays we do it also in multi-stage because some polymer, they have two or three glass transition zones. Glass transition points, sorry. In terms of the physics, the concept behind this process is the fact that polymers are consisted of the long chain of the molecules. What we are going to do in the programming stage is that we are basically going and fold these long chains, chains of molecules. When these folded chains are exposed to the high temperature or electricity current, they would be, there would be enough kinetic energy to return them back to the original shape. And this is very good. Why? Because on one hand, they are acid soluble. They are, if you use an um, appropriate solver, it can take care of them, it can remove them, and it doesn't cause um, significant formation damage if you use them in the production zone. There are also some other properties. They are expandable. They are sticking to each other. So they are forming bridges. We can make them with a different uh, size distribution. And the thing is that when they go inside the fracture and they expand, first they form a seal. And then in the next step, they provide, they provide some circumferential stress. And this extra compressive circumferential stress is basically uh, further strengthening the wellbore. So here are some particles. The original shape of the particles would be spherical, like five millimeters. We compress them and we make them two millimeters. However, these are flakes, basically. What you see here is not um, my bad. I had to use the appropriate shape. But you can see that for these flakes, when they have expanded, the thickness of the flakes have been um, increased significantly. In this case, about 30%. It depends how much you do programming, you can compress the material 30%, 50% or more. Um, the changes in the physical and chemical properties is not significant. This polymer is inert. Basically, this is specific, uh, Polymer that you see in this picture is a specific type of serline. It's commercially available. Uh, it can be uh, bought from a vendor. The activation temperature for this polymer is 67 degrees C. If your target formation temperature is above this temperature, you need to use a polymer with a higher uh, glass transition zone. If you are dealing with the lower um, um, temperature in the formation, you need to use another uh, polymer with the lower glass transition zone. So right now, the polymers that we have used or we have had developed uh, with my collaborator, we have glass transition zone as less as uh, 40 degrees C and we have it as large as 180 degrees C. 
180 degrees C is good for geothermal applications. So this is one example. In this case, the particles, uh, you know, they are separate from each other. So this is, they have been just inside the water, temperature increase and then the temperature decrease, you can see that. Uh, I also need to note that uh, this activation or this expansion is not a thermal expansion. This is not a thermal stress. Because if it is thermal stress, by increasing temperature and lowering the temperature, they should shrink back to the original shape. But this is not the case. This is because of the phase transition inside polymer material. And that caused the really uh, whole process in re irreversible. So the first thing to do is checking that how it is useful in the lab, the lab scale. You know, what we can use is a static fluid tests or permeability plugging apparatus. This is a classic tool that have been used in the field, sorry, in the lab. Um, service company use this uh, tool very often uh, to measure, for example, filter cake and other stuff. You can have, uh, you can replace basically the, um, a slot that you have for the matrix uh, with the, a bigger slot that or tapes, uh, tapered uh, disc that are representing natural fractures. So uh, you can have, um, you know, higher temperature, you can elevate temperature in these uh, tools up to about 240 degree F. In terms of the pressure, this cell, I mean, um, the most equipped one that you can get from fan um, you can go up to 5,000 PSI. But at the high temperatures, uh, 20, 50 degree F is your limit. At the low pressure, obviously you can uh, go with the uh, much higher temperatures. So our initial efforts, experimental efforts on this topic, we're using um, slotted disc like this or tapered disc like this. You can see that the size of the fracture was not significant. But we try to look at the capability of the proposed LCM at different temperature in this slotted disc, although the size of the uh, fracture width or fracture aperture is not as big as we expect. But this was the, our first expert, uh, um, first step in the process. So, the four temperature that we look at 60, 70, and 80, at 60 degrees C, we are obviously below the glass transition zone. At 80 degrees C, we are definitely, we were definitely above the glass transition zone. We record fluid loss, and also we record the maximum pressure that the steel can uh, hold. Just as is important to know how reliable uh, the seal would be, uh, that determines how much deeper you can go uh, before running the uh, next uh, casing program. So here are some results that you can see as the temperature um, increases in these um, cases, you can see that the amount of the fluid loss decreases significantly. And we can go up to 4,500 PSI um, pressure. This is a differential pressure. By no means we can go or we need a, such a high differential pressure. But at least it, it's a good news because it will help us in future to go after wider fractures. Here are some examples of these uh, 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 lab samples that we made running the lab. You can see how the shapes look like, uh, the shape of the seals. But this is not enough. We also need to look at the, how these material will uh, recover or will react at the high confining pressure. That's why we did the strain measurement stress release at the higher pressure to see that if you want to use them in the subsurface, knowing that you have a huge hydrostatic um, weight on top of the uh, treating zone, how much expansion you have. I should note that if you are using even the uh, typical LCM materials, when you put this uh, LCM materials under 3000 PSI pressure, they start shrinking or compacting because of the huge confining pressure. What we have noticed was that we have still a little bit of strain recovery up to uh, 
1800, uh, 2000 PSI, which was significantly good, knowing the fact that uh, we are dealing with the polymer. Although this polymer is not really soft, it's not thermoplastic, uh, it's close to the thermosets. It's actually an um, uh, thermoset uh, polymer. So these are the tests that we did to make sure that the whole thing can expand when it is exposed um, at the high pressure environment. Then we look at the dynamic fluid test. The main difference in the dynamic fluid test opposite to the static fluid test is the fact that the geometry is similar or basically a scale down of the geometry that you have at the well bore. Here you can have the fracture or a slot on the sides, the fluid is circulating back and going upward in the annulus space. Uh, you can have some rotary speed for the drill pipe. You can have a back pressure and also different cell pressure. So in this case, we compared the base mod with no LCM with the case that we use um, polymer blends. So if you look at that, these thick lines is that when you are using the basic mod, no additives, uh, this is the case that we have added polymers. And the last case is when we have blended polymers with some fibers. Uh, there is also another one with the fibers uh, that just to make it uh, simpler and easier to read, I haven't put that. For the fiber alone, it would be similar or between the polymer blend and the uh, base mod. The mods that we have used here are the water-based mod. Uh, the only tricky part to know is that uh, the specific weight of these particles are less than the water. So we need to make sure that we have enough texotropy in the uh, mod. And that can be uh, uh, provided by adding some additives like uh, uh, Bayrat into the uh, mod. Here are more results. The results that I have shown in the previous case have been run at under 120 degree F. 212 degree F is the maximum uh, temperature that we can have in the dynamic fluid loss uh, equipment. Uh, this is the base mod and this y-axis is basically your cumulative mod loss. You can see that the mod loss in the base mod is much higher than when you are using only SMP or when we are combining SMP with the commercial uh, fibers uh, provided by Halliburton. So we can see that the amount of the fluid loss will decrease about 90%. That is a very good significant improvement compared to what is available in the market. So here in this graph, we basically compare the total cumulative loss at the final stage when we are using different combination. So using some LCMs will reduce, especially at the high temperature. This is a temperature that, for example, calcium carbonate is not working. And then when you mix it up with some fiber, uh, you can have even better results. So just some initial conclusion at this point is that we can have a very good result improvement in reducing the um, fluid loss rate. However, this uh, solution is working when you have a fracture width between two to, uh, two to three millimeter width. You know, when you are uh, developing a new product, new material, and there is no uh, really track of recourse for knowing that what should be the best size, what is the optimal size? I know that I have some limitation in terms of the concentration of the LCM that I can use. For example, five to 10%. 10% is the max that I can use um, in a uh, um, worst situation. What should be my optimal size distribution and so forth? That was our uh, driving point to go after modeling this phenomenon, to understand that what is really happening, what is the optimal size distribution that can help us to have these things more effective. We can run some tests, we can run some experiments in the lab, but it takes forever if you just want to go by trial and error like they, these guys did it in the past in the 60s and 70s. 
So when it comes to the uh, modeling the whole process, you need to consider the fact that when the LCM will go and bridge a fracture, you have some particles, you cannot ignore the interaction between the particles, even the friction between the particles, the elasticity of the particles are important. You have the fluid part, uh, the density of the fluid, the viscosity of the fluid is important and the drag forces that is applied uh, from the fluid uh, to the particles and so forth. So you need to have a, basically a multi-physics simulation that can run and look at these um, different aspects of the physics of the problem to be able to have a realistic, simulation that you can verify it in the lab and then use those simulation to come up with a better um, uh, design or uh, schemes for effective, for more effective LCM. So for the particles, we use discrete element methods. For the fluid flow part, we use a finite element. Uh, we basically solve the Navier-Stokes. Um, we basically, by integrating uh, open source software, uh, we managed to uh, do this type of simulation. We just simplified the fracture with the basic and of course the hardest uh, geometry that you can use for sealing, basically having the uh, uh, two plates uh, forming like a, a slot, but they, it's like a wedge shape, um, but the surface is smooth. It, Typically at the field, you have some asperities and stuff like that, that will uh, basically help the LCMs to initiate the bridging point and plugging point for this purpose. And then we look at this, uh, different scenarios. You know, we didn't have any, it's not really possible to uh, run this test in the field to see that how they look like at the field scale. But what we know for sure is what's happening at the lab scale. So we have started with uh, modeling this stuff in the lab scale and comparing the result that we see uh, with this stuff with what we have measured or we have noticed in the lab. So building the uh, models that are comparable with the size of the uh, models that we use, equipment that we use in the lab. So I don't go through the details of the, you know, the whole process of the sealing and the bridging. So, you know, each bridge or seal first will start with some islands that are forming, basically the particles that are clamping together and they form like an island is expanding. Um, it depends on the direction of the fracture where these um, islands start to grow. It also depends on the density, concentration, size of this particle, and so forth. There is a difference between the seal and the bridge. The bridge, um, you could have basically the particles arranged or placed very well along a fracture, but you still have some permeability through the bridge. By seal, we mean that there is not much. You have a significant drop in the flow rate. That is happening, especially when you have these fine particles going and place themselves among these coarse particles. So here are basically some of these simulations that we did. Uh, we look at the two particle size uh, that have been mixed with each other. On the top, A is 100% large particles, uh, B is a 10% small particle with the 90% large particles. The size of the large particles is about twice in diameter of the small particle size. So as you can see in the top two, we don't have a seal. We don't even see any bridges forming. Here we see a bridge that is forming in the 20, 80%. But actually if you, um, um, continue the simulation at the later, uh, till later time, you see that the bridge collapses at some points. But really the ones that you have a very good seal with the, uh, that is a standing um, differential pressure are the ones that we have at the bottom, 40% small particles, 60% uh, large particles. But you know, there are many other parameters involved like the friction of the particles, um, size of the particles with respect to the fracture size, 
and so forth that I don't go into the detail, but simulations like that, it can help us um, to see how which one of them will help us to uh, reduce or stop um, flow rate through the fracture. As you can see, this orange one will give us the best response because you have the seal at the shortest time uh, compared to the others. Actually, this one uh, that you see on the top purple one and the black one, they are not providing any seal. From this uh, green, you start seeing that the seal or pressure start building up. Drilling uh, literature and community, they are very um, uh, confident in the bimodal distribution. There are some uh, commercial products that have been developed in parallel to the empirical uh, uh, solution. We also look at the bimodal distribution and you can see here that the best solution that we can get is from the blue one, which is the top one when we have um, half of the particles, a small size, but each one of these particles, the small size and large size, they have a normal size distribution. So basically the total um, you know, outcome is by modal distribution. We try to compare the, our uh, results, I mean, the best that we can get from the bimodal distribution. It has some of the empirical um, formula or empirical design that exists in the literature. And actually one of them, the last one is coming from Ute in the recent years, uh, Raza Vital 2016. So we look at this empirical uh, simulation, uh, sorry, empirical design or the recipes that have been proposed empirically. We have noticed that um, quite interesting that the empirical recipes are very effective when it comes to the simulation. They are even more effective. They provide a faster seal compared to the, for example, the bimodal that we found after um, uh, you know, some optimization, following some optimization uh, steps. Uh, you know, to have, you know, in general, when we are doing this simulation uh, in the lab or also numerically, we can see that sometimes you don't have enough concentration of the particle to provide the breed. Sometimes you have enough concentration and you have a good mix of the small and the large particle that provide a strong seal that it can take a differential pressure. But sometimes, for example, you have a large number of one of these particles. In that case, it's very likely that these particles are shearing. The best case or the tightest pack uh, is the one that leads to the lowest uh, porosity based on what we have found so far. So, you know, these simulations provide us some um, guidelines, a roadmap for what we need to do and we need to consider different particle size distribution, particles with different sizes to have a more effective um, application of this, but of this new product. But we also need to look at how the things will look like when you look at this problem at the geometries like uh, Velbor and how we can verify our results, our product with a more realistic um, lab test. That is something that all you help us, they have a flow loop that can go to the high temperature. They did in a granite. This is the uh, a rock sample. They have a fracture with about, if I'm not wrong, four millimeter is the maximum opening that they have tried in this approach. So this is where the fluid is passing through. This is the sample. So basically this um, sample is uh, mimicking, simulating the formation. So we have to model basically how the flow, uh, I mean, uh, LCM laden fluid passing through fracture that is leaking to the formation. So we have looked at this geometry, we have developed something that resembling the wellbore and the fracture geometry that they have built and run in the lab to see under what circumstances we can see plugging. So these are examples that show that the plugging uh, it's quite interesting that plugging first initiate the bridge at the wellbore. And as the time passes, this plug is further developed and push or expand uh, inside the reservoir. However, you know, this plugging is not always uh, successful. You know, the flow is coming uh, from the bottom 
in the system. If your particle, for example, is very large, it cannot flow in through the fractures. Sometimes if the uh, flow rate is high or viscosity is low, what will happen is that flow rate at the top of the fracture is very fast. So basically it doesn't, uh, the drag forces is large enough that it's just blow these particles and doesn't let them to accumulate and form a bridge. So you can see that this was complete failure, but in these two cases with the larger volume of SMP, uh, shape memory polymer, we managed to get the ceiling as they have uh, seen uh, in the field. Sorry, it was five millimeter. I mentioned four millimeter. Um, we managed to uh, basically test or basically validate, verify our um, simulation with the experiment that have been done with this material in the field, considering the expansion of the particles, fluid transport, and also the CFDM component. But the, the issue is that uh, when we are trying to see numerically how much, how far, how wider or larger fracture we can go with this setup, we cannot really go more than six, seven millimeters. And six, seven millimeter is not good enough to basically seal the fracture that we see in crystalline rock or some places in the Middle East or South America, like Colombia. That's why we uh, come up with a more sophisticated design for our LCM or shape memory particles. So rather than using particulate or granulate, we start using a ribbons like a this shape. Uh, what's the purpose? So basically this was, this was a fiber at the beginning before programming, we roll it. You know, rolling and folding are different here, yeah, although the folding is very similar. Um, uh, you can see that after activation, it doesn't completely become like a straight um, fiber, but it's getting very close to the fiber. You know, when you are just using this granulate, there are like a small points or islands. They are simply, you can think about it. It's like a zero dimensional particles that you are throwing through the fractures. It cannot really plug the fracture very well. But if we can mimic the industry success with the fibers, with the shape memory polymers, maybe we have a better chance. You can see that the size is about eight millimeter. Uh, the diameter of this fiber, but after expansion, it becomes um, about uh, 50 millimeter or about uh, five centimeters if you pull it out. Uh, this is not the only geometry that we can consider. We can go for a star shape. With a star shape, you have two bending basically. You have one bending here, one bending here. This is the geometry and how the things will look like in the program shape versus this one. So we have developed some fixture to do these things at the uh, larger scale, faster scale. Um, you can, you know, uh, materials like this can be also uh, uh, made by um, 3D printing. However, to make this stuff for 3D printing, we had to make our own fibers because they are not available commercially. So this is an example of how it looks like when you have a mixture of these disc-shaped rebounds with the uh, granulate. So we have used this shape with different uh, diameter, I mean, after programming. Uh, sorry, this is not after program. This is the length of the fiber before we roll it. Once for 25 millimeter, the other one for the 40 millimeter. Uh, we have used some concentration also of this granulate because um, um, making these ribbons is a little bit a slow process. You can see that by using this uh, disc shape, we can not only get a very good results in terms of the, uh, reducing the fluid loss, we could also increase the differential pressure and we could go up to about uh, uh, 10 millimeter uh, fracture width. So we can, uh, this is a very big fracture. You know, 10, 12 millimeter is the largest slot size that you can find uh, from fan or other vendors because basically there is no solution commercially available in the industry to seal this fracture. Uh, we also look at the combination of the tree. When we use combination of the tree, we can go even for the larger uh, with uh, 12 millimeter. 12 millimeter is the maximum 
fracture weight that we can have our PPA uh, equipment with the extra cell, it can accommodate it. For the larger one, we need to have a very special equipment, special design equipment that I mean, the cost is astronomical. Did this stuff have been done with the water base mod? Only bayrot have been added um, to the uh, water. So you can see clearly how the things will look like. You can see that uh, some of these disc uh, ribbons have been um, activated. Some of them have not been activated, but all of the granulates have been activated very well. You know, we didn't limit ourselves to just fibers. Uh, we look at the spiders, um, you know, nets like that. We pull it. When you pull it, it becomes more like a fiber, and then you can uh, roll it. It would be very small, but when it exposed to the high temperature, the good thing is that it can expand. So it's provide basically like a net, like a fish net to stop the particles for passing through and building a seal. So if we look at the three different design. One was the a mixture of the disc, which becomes like a spherical uh, disc shape and a star shape. Uh, and also we look at uh, this uh, 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 rolled spiders. Uh, you can see each one of these items that have been activated in our uh, experimental sample. So here are the three different cases that we have run. And you can see that uh, by using a disc ribbon and a spider, we can get the most effective one and also with a very high differential pressure. This, I mean, in terms of the differential pressure, we could go to the maximum that the burst disc of our PPA equipment could handle. There are also some other shapes like a, a spring shape and zigzag and other stuff that we have tried. Uh, um, to basically try um, basically expire uh, all our options in terms of the design. And at the bottom, you can see um, how this plug looked like under CT scan. So that help us to, for example, see that when bending is working, when the uh, twisting is helpful. For example, twisting most of the time is not very successful in activating uh, this matter. So basically in terms of the plugging mechanism rather than limiting ourselves to the granular one, we try to come up with a new idea and develop or proposing a, imposing basically new plugging mechanism by providing the nets and fibers um, to basically seal the fraction. Um, so you can see that how these uh, different element or hodgepodge uh, can become the elements that form the topology for providing a seal or a slab of the seal uh, very efficiently. So having said that, um, I would like to um, uh, finish my uh, presentation. Sorry that if I have to go through some steps very quickly to meet the limited time that we have. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dahid Talagani. We appreciate your presentation today. Fascinating topic. I want to give an opportunity first to students. Any graduate students, undergraduate students who would like to ask a question? Go ahead and just unmute. Going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to open it up to any students, any faculty to ask questions. Dr. Lake, I see you're unmuted. No, I'm not. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were gonna jump in for a question. Sorry, Dr. Lake. Well, I actually, I do have one question. Uh, uh, sure. This is sort of an irrelevant question, but you know, these polymers really smell bad. What does it smell like in your laboratory? Oh, no it smells. They are very inert. No smell. They don't, they don't smell at all? No, 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 no. Otherwise, I had a big problem with our HSA and- I would uh, guess so, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, luckily, these are very stable polymers, so we don't have any problem with that. Um, even they can resist against a low concentrations of acids. Hmm. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Lake. Sure. Other questions? I have to admit, um, Professor Dahi Talagani, when, when you start presenting, I started Google searching. I, I didn't know anything about this. And I was just looking, I'm really interested in this. Are you getting pulled for other applications besides subsurface? Or are you doing anything otherwise with this? Yes, actually, uh, in the first place, uh, when I start working um, uh, this type of polymer, I was looking for an expandable propane. And after doing some tests in the lab, we found that not only they do not expand, they seal the fracture. And that was a starting point to redress them as a LCM. Um, but that was the initial point. However, we have also came up with a polymer that can be used as a propant, but the cost is significant. It's just a publication and patent on that. And we also use that as an expandable additive for the cement to prevent uh, microannulus formation to improve a cement ductility and also uh, avoid cracking between the cement and casing. All right, very yes. cool. So is awesome, that similar you. to soil stabilization just in cement? Because a lot of times, like when they stabilize banks of a river and so forth, there's like a netting. And I would assume that these are similar type of materials. Uh, that is geosynthetic stuff. Uh, right. Those stuff are a little bit cheaper than these, and they are not really activating. They okay. are basically um, a stretch like a carpet. Right. Um, and they probably don't need thermals. Being... Yes, there is no thermal yeah. expansion or things like that. But you know, uh, many polymers have this uh, shape memory effect. Um, even the paper clips that we are using is metal. It has some shape memory. If you can, you know, search it on uh, YouTube and you will find it. But the point is that the amount of the recovery uh, that you get only in some specific polymers are good enough for this purpose. You know, for example, for the propane application, we have to come up with a large stress recovery, which was not really. Um, available in the polymer that was now. They have to make another polymer for that purpose. But that polymer turns out to be also a little bit brittle. So we had to do some coating and so forth. Uh, but you cannot use something like that at the largest scale. You cannot compete with the um, sand as a propane. But for this application, LCM, uh, operators are willing to pay. I mean, Halliburton and Schoenberger did the new stuff. They charge the operator significantly. Halliburton use uh, some sort of shape memory polymers to stop prop and flow back. Um, they um, commercialized it a um, few years ago, but I don't know what really happened. Uh, you know, the market had lots of up and down. And speaking of thermal, what are the highest temperatures <clears throat> these can go up to? Okay, with this, uh, with the serling, we can go to 300 um, degree F. But with the other one that I mentioned to you with the, for the geothermal, um, we, uh, this glass transition zone is 180 degrees C and we can go up to about 350 degrees C before, you know, the thing is that these stuff are not melting right away. They are just start softening. We don't want to get into that regime in that range because as soon as you get into that range, uh, uh, they might move uh, right. because we are dealing with the high pressure. We need to make sure that you are not reaching to the zone to the point that the young modules start stepping down very quickly. Okay. Interesting stuff. <laughs> and hard to, well, it's difficult to predict what's going to ultimately happen. Yes. Is there, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Perdonovich. Other questions? 
All right, Professor Dahi Talagani, thank you so much thank for joining, so coming much. back to the 40 acres virtually. Okay, thank you. Always thank welcome. You so um, and we do apologize we're not doing this in person. We would love to have you here. No, no, no. You know, take you up for Texas barbecue or something like that. So um, next time we'll definitely make sure we get you down. Okay. Sure, we'll sure. Make Please go and treat yourself in Rudy's on my behalf. Ah, uh, <laughs> oh, done already. I did that yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's something that we don't have it here. Definitely. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Hey, see Bye. ya. Bye.